So this is what our lovely presentation is about, how to produce engaging content and grow your Instagram audience. So who are the DCN? We are the Digital Culture Network. If you don't know that, then you're on the wrong presentation, but um, we are an organization for the arts and culture organization for, for, for ACE, for um, arts, arts Council England. Um, you can get in contact with us through the digital network at artscouncil.co.uk. Uh, what do we do? We have a website. Um, and you can find all of our relevant presentations, all of our web relevant webinars, any work that we do in the sector. If you'd like to get in contact with us, again, you can join us through the website. And this is another place where you can actually drop us an email. There we go. We have a YouTube page. On our YouTube page, it has lots of information about some of the webinars we've done previously. We've got... Um, videos about live streaming, about uh, SEO, about e-commerce, anything that we've presented in the past um, will be on our YouTube page for you to go and watch back as and when you need. Mm -hmm. So like I said, get in touch, digital network at artscouncil.org.uk, or you can join us on Twitter at ace underscore DCN, okay? So without further ado, I will now introduce you to Phoebe. Phoebe works for Grazia. She's a social media editor for Grazia. She is an Instagram specialist. And if you saw my last Instagram presentation, I did recommend you all give Phoebe a follow back then because she really knows her stuff about Instagram and the platform. And although she comes from a commercial background, the, the skills that she talks about and the things that she goes through today will really give you an idea of how you can really optimize your Instagram account and take it to the next level and really get the best out of the platform, okay? So I will now stop sharing my screen and hand you over to Phoebe. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah, I'm Phoebe Park. I will be sharing a little bit about how to make the most of your Instagram um, on this presentation. And as Hayden said, we've got questions in the middle. There's always loads of questions when it comes to Instagram. So there are questions in the middle and questions at the end as well. So I'm going to share my screen uh, where I have a presentation. Oh, that's a bit of a preview. Um, and yeah, if you can't hear me or there's some issue, let me know in the chat and I will pause and I'll try and speak relatively slowly. Um, so yeah, this is the title of our presentation and what we're going to be talking about today, how to produce aging content and grow your Instagram audience. Um, that what everyone wants to do, isn't it? Um, so today in more detail, what you're gonna learn is how to create engaging, valuable content that gets shared far and wide. Encourage your followers to actually interact. How to use Instagram insights to grow your following and how to use the newer releases on Instagram to stay ahead. So, Oh, I need to move this. Sorry, this is just my own issue. Yeah, okay. Um, so I can see my own presentation. Okay, so the first thing is how to create engaging, valuable content that gets shared far and wide. So what does valuable content mean? Um, that's the first thing we're gonna go through. Uh, and my definition is, and a definition that you've probably seen shared quite widely is, Valuable content either educates, entertains, or inspires. And I've got some examples on the following slide. But when people, that's what people mean when they say, you know, you need to share valuable content. So you're either educating people, so you're teaching them something that they didn't know, you're entertaining them, think about perhaps some of the comedians you follow or the meme pages that you follow, and the TikTokers. And then inspirational content can also be seen as aspirational content. So people see the images that you post and they want to immediately insert themselves into that environment. I want to be at that art gallery. I want to be at that exhibition. I want to be laying at the beach, whatever it is. That's the definition of that inspirational and aspirational content. Engaging content makes people immediately want to comment, share, save, and like. Now, can you think about the last piece of content that you engaged with? What is it that made you take that action? Did you, was it a picture of your friend and you just thought, okay, I'm just going to support them with a like? Or was what was the reason that you engaged with that piece of content? And how can you make sure that every time you post, people are immediately compelled to 
take action and share, save, like, whatever it is that you want them. Uh, people typically share content that makes them look intelligent. So think about, you know, if I'm sharing like a New York Times article, I'm obviously I find it interesting, but I'm also kind of saying to people, look, you know, I read the New York Times. I'm really smart. This is kind of like a virtue signal on my part. That's why people share content. And what kind of content do you have that other people might want to share for that reason? Um, content they relate to, again, going back to memes and things, that's the kind of content that people want to share because they think, oh my gosh, that's me. That's me that Monday morning, or that's me that Friday or that Saturday. Um, and they tap into that mood. Content that they find funny, content that expresses something that they couldn't otherwise have put into words. So if we think about over the pandemic, there was lots of people sharing content of, you know, I feel so isolated, I feel so lonely, or maybe childcare and they were thinking oh my gosh am I the only person in this situation they post it on Instagram and then other people can relate to it and start sharing and, and liking etc um, and your, your content shouldn't just be about you but should also be adding value to your followers and we'll go more um, into that as we continue so here are some examples here of educational content um, so Ikea, I love this example. Um, one of the great things about going to Ikea is of course you're buying uh, your flat furniture, etc. but then you're going to have something to eat. So this is a recipe that Ikea posted on Instagram so that while the store goes, you can recreate that at home. That is an example of educational content. You're teaching people how to make this dish of meatballs and then this is an example from Tate on the right hand side explaining using children which is very cute explaining an art concept and people might have never heard of it before but through this content they can go away and say okay I know what this is now and they can kind of like brag to their friends about it um yeah that this these are some examples of educational content so I'm just checking the chat. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that at the end. Have a focus. Bear with me. Okay, fine. We're moving on. Now, entertaining content. Um, this is from on the right hand side is from an art meme page, which I'm slightly obsessed with. Uh, when you're on your lunch break and consider not going back. Um, and then on the left hand side here is me during the week, I'll just get a small coffee, I'm going to save some money, and then at the weekend paying like 65 pounds for an Uber home. So these are just some examples of entertaining content. I'm sure that you've seen all the examples on your own Instagram feeds, but just um, so we're clear on the difference between the three types of content. And then the third type is inspirational content, which is likely to be the kind of content that you guys are currently sharing um, it is perfectly polished it's beautiful you immediately want to jump into the scenario and go and see these pieces of art and be part of these pictures um, that is inspirational content mm -hmm. so how do you make your content shareable um, and why is it important to make your content shareable? So it's all very well and good, you posting on Instagram and it being beautiful and it being the best thing. But if you are perhaps under pressure to um, move, so the lights come on, bear with me. Okay. Go back. Um, how do you make your content shareable? So it's important to make your content shareable because that's how you grow your following. So you're posting on your feed and your followers love it, then they share it to other people and those people are thinking about wow, what amazing content I want to come and follow this person too. So how to make your content more share more is to make it relatable to your audience. You can't do that until you figure out who your audience is. How to do this? run a series of polls, do a formal questionnaire, 
Or you can use trial and error to try and figure out who your typical follower is. How old are they? What do they enjoy about the arts? Are they, you know, do they know everything about the arts or are they somebody who, uh, you know, has never been to a gallery before, but they're really interested in going and that's why they're following you. What do they do at the weekend? What kind of memes would they find funny? That's the kind of thing you need to find out about your audience. And then you can start to tailor your content to them um, so that they comment and they say, wow, like this is so me. Uh, you want to select images and graphics that, you know, with this typical follower in mind, what kind of language do they use? Uh, your Instagram account should always have a specific tone of voice. And then in terms of making things shareable, think about the first slide of your carousel or the first line of your caption, the first 15 seconds of your video. Are these fully optimized for sharing? Um, you know, now all videos auto play when you share them to stories and the story is only 15 seconds long. So that first 15 seconds is really when you've got to grab people right at the start of your caption. By the time you say, this is a photo that was taken during, you've missed, people are not going to continue to read the rest of it because they, okay, it didn't me immediately, I'm gonna move on. There's so much noise on Instagram, you're constantly competing with reels and all sorts of different things. So that's really important to make your content as shareable as possible. Um, and how to make your content shareable continued is, actually ask people to share your content. Now, this is something that we, you know, speak to people and they say, oh, no one's sharing my content, I don't know why. Have you asked them to? Have you asked them to share your content? So if you're creating an infographic, you can put a little label on the infographic that says, share to your story. A really simple prompt, but people, you know, might think, oh, I really like that, but then not go any further. Um, that is a really good way to prompt people to share. Or in the caption, you can say, um, if this helps you share to your story. And thank people for sharing. So if someone tags you in their Instagram stories post um, and says, you know, I loved this from such and such an organization, I'm gonna share it. Then you can say, thank you so much for sharing. And they're gonna be way more likely to continue to share your content going forward. Um, memes and helpful infographics are actually some of the top performing pieces of content at the moment. You, I think it's a good idea to think about how these trends, how you can use these trends for your audience. Uh, you might think, oh, memes are too low brow, or, you know, I don't want to get into it. But I think that for every organization, there is a way, whether it's subtle or whether it's really obvious, to use memes and helpful infographics on your Instagram page. Um, and then helpful and useful content might be more basic than you think. Um, for example, the best way to go around an exhibition, you know, or tips for first time gallery visitors. If someone, if you do all that polling and uh, you do a survey and you find out, okay, 50% of our audience have never actually gone to an exhibition. That's a prime example of a time that you need to post something that's okay. Here's, you know, top tips. What do I need to bring with me? What are the people going to tell me to shush? Can I come in a big group? All those kind of questions. Um, and then where possible, use a neutral color palette for your infographics. So people who are worried about their feed aesthetic won't be put off from sharing. Now I've put some examples of shareable content. Um, now the example on the left is from Glossier. They're beauty company, um, but these kind of posts that are everything you need to know about, that could be adapted for a, an art concept, everything you need to know about your organization, um, everything you need to know about this trending movement that's happening at the moment. Those are really good examples of educational content that you can use that will get shared far and wide. And on the right, it says tiny habits that can effortlessly improve, effortlessly improve your life. So that could be if people are struggling to consume art, they're struggling to get out to galleries, etc. You can put in some ways, you know, that they can remove those barriers or 
ways to help the arts, you know, after the pandemic and after a time where these organizations have not been open, donating, um, helping out an artist, buying from, you know, if a gallery has a website, those kind of things. And those little tips to help are really good examples of shareable content. Um, okay, so next. How to encourage your followers to actually interact with your content. It can feel like you're kind of talking to yourself when you're posting on Instagram, you post, maybe you ask a question in your caption, no one replies. You're thinking that of all the followers you have, are people actually at all interested in, in what you're saying. You have to remember that your Instagram post is only half the conversation. Once you've posted, the rest of the content is in the comments. You shouldn't do what I call posting and ghosting. And lots of other people um, call it this too, where you just, okay, as long as I've got an amazing feed, I don't really need to worry about um, interacting with people. I'm just going to post and then leave them, you know, to figure it out. You wouldn't go to a party and walk up to someone and start a conversation with them. And then they reply and you walk away. You'd be considered quite rude. So don't do that on Instagram. Make sure you're interacting with people in the comments. I know it's time consuming, but it's totally worth it. So people are not going to continue to comment if um, you're not replying to them. Figure out which one action you want people to take and actually ask them to do it. So in your caption, you can say, tag someone who this picture reminds you of, or tag the person who comes to mind when you see this image. Or your call to action can be tap the link in bio to buy a ticket to this exhibition, this class, this opening, and ask questions in your captions. When do you think this photo was taken? Um, comment with your best guess, make it into a game. Maybe it's a competition and you offer a prize. That is the kind of thing that's going to get lots of comments in your caption, in your um, lots of comments in your comments and boost your post and more people are gonna see it. Here are some examples of captions that convert followers into customers. And we'll talk a bit later on about some of the reasons why you might be on Instagram and what some of your goals might be. But if your goal, if your primary goal on Instagram is to get people to buy tickets um, or buy artwork or buy something, then these are some examples um, that I really like to use. So I would say 70% of your captions should have a call to action in them. Um, so that first one there, tap the first link in bio to shop now. Far too many organizations have their generic uh, homepage, webpage in their bio. As a customer, potential customer, potential person who's gonna come and visit, I, you need to make it as easy as possible for me. So if I see a, a call to action that says, buy your ticket from our website. Then I go to your website, it's the generic page. I've got a pop-up already asking me to accept cookies. And then I'm being asked to join your newsletter. Then I've got to navigate and find my way to the link that you're referring to. So I would use a service like Linktree or Milkshake or Planoly. And then you've got a few different and you can direct people and say, it's the second link, it's the first link. You know, this is specifically where you need to go to. Um, or tap the link in bio to all your copy. If it's a book or something, um, tap the image to shop. If you have Instagram shopping set up, um, if you sell physical products from your website, Instagram shopping is a great, uh, something that you should definitely be doing. Um, and there's information about how to set up Instagram shopping on um, the Instagram website. Um, share to your story if this helped you. That's a great one. Um, you want people to share your content and so you need to ask them to do it. Um, and that's a really easy, nice prompt and, and way to get them to do it. Um, and then comment below with your own suggestions. You know, in any topic, we're not, um, there's always room for more, you know, if, you, if there's a listicle, there's room for other people to add their own ideas and then it becomes uh, more of a collaboration than just, this is me, I'm posting all this content. 
And then your captions should not be paragraphs long. The only um, exception I would say to that is if it's storytelling, if you're telling, uh, for example, Nat Geo um, on Instagram or The Cut, they have some longer captions and they, because they're telling the whole story and it's in their tone of voice and it all kind of makes sense. It shouldn't just be paragraphs long because this is everything I know about this picture and I'm just going to put it in the caption. Be really intentional about the length of your captions. Um, your captions shouldn't refer to events happening that day. So if you have a one day exhibition or a one day extravaganza and you are posting about it at 12 o'clock that day and the cutoff is like three o'clock to get tickets, it doesn't make sense because as we know on Instagram, we'll see things 24 hours, 48 hours, etc. later. That's something you would put on stories or that you would post maybe a week ahead and, and letting them know that that's the cutoff day. Um, your captions should not have dots in them. That used to be how we separated uh, paragraphs in our captions, but now you just press the return key and you can make spaces in your captions. Um, they shouldn't be hard to read. So, you know, I think it obviously depends on your audience, but remember that not everyone on Instagram has like a PhD in the topic that you're talking about. So use layman terms, you know, use a language that the majority of people are going to be able to understand. Um, and they definitely should not be left blank. Always, always use your captions. Um, I've been talking for a long time. We're halfway through. I think, Caden, correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to take a couple of questions at this point. Cool. Um, yes. Sorry, give me a second. Oh, Hello. Okay. Questions. We have three questions. One has already been answered. Um, when is the right time to post on Instagram? I think we kind of talk a, a little bit about that in the second half. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, again, what is the idle length for captions? I think Phoebe just kind of went through that a little piece there. Um, could you spell out, could you repeat spell out those sites you've rec recommended alongside Linktree? So um what are some of the other sites? I know you said Planally. What are some of the other sites you mentioned? Yeah, so I said Linktree, Planally, and Milkshake. Milkshake, okay, there you go. Yeah. And I kind of got answer in the in the chat already about that as well. Okay. Right. Is there a specific number? A specific number. What do you what do you mean by that, Amy? Three lines is written. I'm not sure what you mean about that one, so I might have to. Uh, uh, oh, for captions, for, is there a specific number of how many lines? Um, not really. Is there a specific number you'd say for, ca for the captions? Not no, no, no. Yeah, I don't think so. I think it's just, I guess, for in my mind, a short caption is like three or four lines. And a long caption is, you know, like 20, 30 lines. So yeah, I think you want to be on the short end of things usually, unless you're telling, you know, a really specific story. Um, we come in, we, we talk a little bit about hashtags a little bit later in the, um, the presentation. Thoughts on using emojis and sharing and use, sharing content using a reposting app. Okay, never, never use reposting apps ever, ever, ever. Um, that's actually, I should, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> Don't use reposting apps because you can see, like, you can see the little repost thing. I think it, it aesthetically doesn't look good. And best etiquette, if you want to repost someone, is you contact the person. This is like a huge copyright issue um, going on at the moment on Instagram. But you contact the person, you say, hi, I love your content. I really use, like to repost this. Is that okay? They say yes or no. If they say yes, you say, this is how I'm gonna credit you. And then you use, um, there's loads of websites where you can download the high res version of what someone's posted. Um, I use one called Inflact, Inflact, but there's loads of them. Um, and then you download the high res and then you, you post it. Um, and then you credit them prominently um, in the caption. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't use reposting apps. What was the first part of what you said? Uh, thoughts on using emojis 
This will be the oh, last yeah. question, then we're going to a quick break and then we'll come back. Yeah. So, you know, I think it depends. I think you've got to have a really specific tone of voice for your organization and you decide um, whether you want to use emojis. I think a brand like Lossier, for example, it's fun, young, Gen Z beauty brand. You totally expect to see emoji there. I guess if you are not, if you are like the government on Instagram, you don't really want to see emoji. So I think you make that call based on, again, finding out who your followers are and how they speak. And then you kind of like mirror them and what they would expect from you, I would say. Okay, so we're gonna go for a quick um, five minute break. Um, so if everybody can come back at, what's that? 2.32, it's a bit of a random time. Um, and, then, and then we'll answer the rest of the questions um, afterwards. Right. See you in a sec.
Okay, and we are back. Um, there's lots of questions in the chat and lots of questions in the Q&A, so we will answer those um, at the end of the presentation. Okay. So many questions. I love it. Um, let me get my presentation back. Um, yeah, I'll definitely leave time for questions because it seems like there are lots of them. Um, can you see that okay? Yep, I can see it. All right, great. Um, so next we're going to move into Instagram insights. Um, so some, I always meet, there's two groups of people. Some people look at their insights every day. Some people don't even know what I'm talking about when I say insights, but um, it's, and I'll, I have an example a bit later on of, of how to find them. Um, but the most important information you can find in the insights is how your posts performed by reach. Um, don't bother worrying about vanity metrics, like how many followers did I gain this week? How many people unfollowed me? And kind of um, obsessing over like, all oh, these people, all these people unfollowed me. So I would say it, it really depends on how much content you post. So I post probably five to 10 pieces of content a week. And so I go in once a week. If you're posting three times a week, you might do it at the end of the month. But once a week or once a month, go into your insights and check what your top performing piece of content for the week are or for the month are by reach. And the question you want to ask yourself, the reason why you're doing this is, how can you replicate this? Um, how, if it's a meme, what other rele you know, relevant memes can I use? Um, if it's an infographic, what other types of infographics can I use? Uh, what is it about these pieces of content that made people really engage and interact? Was it the design? Was it the aesthetics of it? Was it the, the caption? Was it funny? You know, what was what was it that made people interact? And how can you replicate that in your uh, coming content? Um, and then obviously, depending on why you're on Instagram, so you might just be on there to create awareness of your organization, or you might, it might just be purely for sales. You know, I'm on Instagram just to make sales and get people to buy this, that, and the other. Um, so you might then set yourself a target around how many website taps you got, which you can see in your insights, or how many sales you made um, through Instagram. Um, so here's an example. These are my insights. Um, please don't judge me for the amount of Kardashians that are on here. But so reach in the last 30 days, um, and then I can see, okay, that's the reach, 14.3. Why do people engage with that piece of content? Um, and then as, as I go all the way down to the bottom, I can see things that didn't perform so well. And why was that? Why were people not engaging with that content? So that's just an example of what it will look like when you go into your insights. Um, and then here's the insights overview of the last seven days. You can see accounts reach, accounts engaged, total followers. And then here is um, the content that you shared. So this might be something that at the end of the year, you want to look at, okay, how many accounts did we reach? Or if you had a particularly good week, send it to your boss or line manager and say, look at the amazing job I'm doing on Instagram. But you, it, it's really useful to see week to week, you know, are you improving, are you not? But I would focus way more on this bit, which is which are the individual posts that did really well, that got shared far and wide, that were commented on, et cetera. Um, now I'm going to talk about some of the newer releases on Instagram. Um, there are so many, <laughs> so I will focus on reels, but I think, you know, in the Q and A, maybe we can get into some of the others if you guys, uh, have questions about them, but as a general rule, every time Instagram launches a new feature, it's a really good idea to be among the first people to try it out. Uh, because as we saw with Instagram live and with reels, Instagram is always going to be really keen to show off the new launches and as a result, your content gets a boost. There's still time to make reels work for your brand. Uh, I've got some examples later on, but some examples could be a guided tour of a new exhibition in 60 seconds. You're not giving the whole thing away because you can't possibly show the whole thing in, in that time. 
people st will still want to come and visit, but give them a sneak peek of what they might see if they come um, and visit. Or five things you didn't know about this specific artist that you have an exhibition of at that time, or someone who you know is really popular with your audience. Um, and then something that you'll see on TikTok loads is these oddly satisfying and ASMR reels. So if you have an artist, maybe they're like spattering paint on something, or maybe crowds are moving through your um, exhibition and you do a time lapse of them or something. Uh, those kind of real ideas, it's kind of thinking outside the box. It's not just this is our new exhibition, it's raising awareness of your organization using some of these new features that are on Instagram and Reels is a huge one. I'm sure you know when you log into Instagram now, it's like Reels, Reels, Reels everywhere. And it's totally, there's totally still time to tap into um, Reels for your brand. So here are some examples of Reels. So I put the one on the left in, it says, things we hate about fall, it's American. But I put that example in because reels don't have to be, you know, you don't have to overthink them. They don't have to be really complicated. You don't have to star in them. You don't have to look amazing when you're in them. You don't have to do hair and makeup, etc. It can just be really simple. So things all artists know, or, you know, most annoying things about being a curator, any of those things using the talent that's within your organization um, and make it really relatable again once you've figured out who exactly is in your audience then you can really tailor these and make sure that they work um, for your followers and then on the right hand side there those are from the Louvre and it is influencers who so in that example with the Mona Lisa they're standing in front of it and um, they suddenly like pick it up off the wall and it's not the real Mona Lisa, but it's a replica of it. And it's just reminding people like, this is what's here, come and see it. So these are some really fun um, examples of how you can use reels for your organizations. And then uh, I have some examples here, three common mistakes that arts organizations make on Instagram and how you can avoid them. Um, and I'll go through these quite quickly. So just posting pictures. So it, I'm of the opinion that in this time, your feed should really be a mix of different content types. It should be video, it should be graphics, it should be images, there should be text-based posts. Um, it shouldn't just be, you know, gone are the days, Instagram's been around for 10 years, we're not gonna be using the same Instagram strategy we used when Instagram launched we need something fresh, something new, and it's that mix of different things. Um, think about how you can educate your followers and stand out from every other art account that's just posting amazing image after amazing image. Um, having no call to action in the caption is a huge no-no, or just saying like, oh, buy a ticket now. Where do they buy it? You know, how, how much is it? When is the exhibition on? All those things make it really easy for people. The second mistake is making it all about you. Um, lots of us do this, it's not just arts organizations, but um, buy this, buy that, come here, come and see this. Um, you need to make it about your audience too. Not answering your comments and DMs we touched on earlier. Um, not doing any research so you don't have a clear idea of who your target customer is and what they need from you. So you know if you're trying to appeal to the masses and trying to appeal to everybody you end up appealing to no one because no one knows really who it is that you're speaking to um and then the third mistake is not producing enough timely relevant content content is everything you can worry about your feed aesthetic and your matching highlight covers and your bio and your profile pictures all day but content is what's going to set you apart from everyone else so you don't need every post to be perfect before you put it out there. Go on TikTok and you'll see that that rough and ready unfiltered content is outperforming everything else. You know, I'm sure you've seen, you know, some old screenshot of a meme do much better than, you know, a perfectly designed and curated amazing image. Um, posting images that are not the right size for the platform. So your art team has like made a banner that's gonna go on an email or something. You just think, oh, I'll just stick it on Instagram. You need to optimize each post for the platform that it's on. 
And then not tapping into trends, memes, the current news cycle. Think about why each piece of content needs to be posted that day. How is it relevant to the week, the day, the month, the time of year, what your followers are going through at, at that moment? And then I've just included um, my top five rules of Instagram, um, which is first of all, always post in portrait. Those are the dimensions there. I know you guys are going to tell me that you can't do that because art comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. I know, but that would be for optimum uh, reach. That's what I would suggest. The reason is, is that when you're on your home feed, if you just open Instagram and you're in your home feed, you're scrolling past things and that is the biggest possible size that you can make a post. And so people are way more likely to stop scrolling and pay attention just because of the amount of real estate that you're taking up with your post. Um, your post isn't complete without a call to action. We've covered um, how many followers you have is totally irrelevant. Don't worry about that when you're looking at your insights. You need to pick a niche and stick to it. Um, if you try and be everything to everybody, you end up being nothing to no one. And then hashtags, I know were, um, maybe we'll talk about them a bit more because someone asked about them, but using niche hashtags is really important. You using hashtag art is, you're not gonna get seen. Uh, it doesn't matter how many followers you have, you're not likely to get seen on the hashtag page for hashtag art. If you use something that's between 20 and 50K in size, that's like the size of the hashtag, you're way more likely to be seen because there's not as much competition and also people are actually looking for those. So can I think of a relevant art hashtag off the top of my head? Probably not, but when you go into Instagram and you go in the search bar, start typing, you know, art activities for kids or art, you know, whatever it is your specific niche is, and then you'll see that, you know, the sizes pop up and you'll know, okay, I'm gonna pick something that's between 20,000 and 50,000 posts in size. Um, these are just some FAQs, uh, which I think that this presentation will be sent around afterwards so you can have a look. But yes, you should be using reels. Um, how often should you post? I think that was um, a question that was already asked. Totally depends on your goals. But most successful creators and organizations are posting at least daily on Instagram. Um, well, posting too often and knowing my followers. No, uh, if they unfollow you, they didn't like your content anyway. If you're posting in your niche, you're doing what you said you would do in your bio and your content is valuable. So it's either educating, entertaining or inspiring people. There's no such thing as too much content. Um, how do I say consistent? I suggest creating content two weeks ahead of time. Um, and then even if you have a busy day, something happens, you're, you're always gonna be in a good place in terms of content. And then um, how do I get more followers? The age old question, it's all about creating shareable content and collaborating with other people in your niche, whether that's influencers, other organizations, experts, etc. So I think we are now gonna do Q and A and I will stop sharing my screen. Yes. Okay, so there's plenty, plenty questions. Let's get my there we go. Okay, so we've got loads of questions here. Um, there's one thing I did want to talk to you about. I had my own question mm -hmm. before we kind of got into these questions. I think this would be quite a good one. There's pizza, someone's um, spoken about influencers and how you connect and how you go your pages. Um, do you have to use influencers? And we were speaking about the new feature where you can tag and, and partner with organizations. I thought that might be something good to, to explain how that works. Yeah, definitely. So there's a new Instagram feature called um, collaborations and you post as you would normally post on Instagram, you post your picture or whatever. And then when you go to tag someone, you have the option to invite collaborator. So you then invite, if it's influencer or whoever, maybe you've created this content together. And then when you post that and they accept the tag, 
the content not only appears on your Instagram feed, but also their Instagram feed. And you share followers, I'm sorry, you share the comments, you share the likes, all of that. So you could be wanting to partner with an influencer and instead of just the content living on their platform or your platform, lives on both. And then you're kind of cross pollinating across audiences and making the most of that collaborative piece of content. That's a good one. Um, and then how about when you're adding um, hashtags in stories? Does that, ha does that help at all? Is it, is it something you should do, shouldn't do? I think they only really, so the point of hashtags is that you, your content gets discovered and you end up on those hashtag pages, on the explore page, all of that. That only really works with feed posts. The only exception, the only reason I would ever use a hashtag in my story is if you're an event or you have a specific hashtag for your exhibition, for example, and everyone's at this exhibition, they're tagging you and they're sharing the hashtag and then you can see, you know, go in and see and, and share them, etc. So I think if it's event based, I would use hashtags, but if not, then no, I wouldn't. Um, question from Carl, Carly, does posting to stories at the same time as to your grid help boost your post reach? Um, yes, it does. It's worth doing. I would say do it, um, especially if it's a reel, because with reels, the views count on when they're on reels, when they're on your feed, and they also count in your stories. So definitely with reels. And yeah, I think it's a good thing to do. It's not going to be a game changer. If you don't do it, it's not going to ruin your reach. It's not, you know, a, a huge thing. I would say hashtags are more important when it comes to reach. But yeah, I think it's a good way to make people aware if they've missed your feed post, here it is in your story. ASMR, can you just explain what that is again? Yes. I don't, do I know what ASMR stands for? <laughs> no, I don't think I do. Audio, um, sensory, something. Stuff, yeah. It's those, if you go on TikTok, you'll see literally videos of people like squishing sponges or they are speaking, I can't do it, but speaking into a, a mic very quietly or spattering paint or crushing things. Those kind of um, videos where they're kind of oddly satisfying and um, they're quite random. And I don't know why we're obsessed with them, but they kind of do something to our senses that people love. Autonomous sensory meridian, meridian, meridian responses. There we go. <laughs> um, any suggestions for scheduling software? Yeah, so I, um, Planoly is good um, in terms of, oh, I love the home edit. Um, sorry, looking at the comments. Um, the home edit is really good uh, for, it's like an organiza home organization account if you're into that. But yeah, they do really cool um, ASMR. Um, scheduling tools, yeah. So Planoly is good. Um, Hootsuite, lots of them are, are great. They pretty much do it later. That's a good one. They do the same thing. Um, I'm not a huge fan of scheduling tools. Um, I think that they're fine. That they are not gonna be, your content's way more important than like how it gets out there. But yeah, planning's good and later. Does commenting and liking other organization accounts posts actually help grow your following? I know we differ on this opinion, but go on. <laughs> This is one of my pet peeves. Um, I think, you know, it's in principle, yes, it's a good thing to do. Comment and and engage with people and be, you know, like a human being on yeah. social media. I think that's really great. My problem is, is that now all the marketing people are saying, wake up in the morning, find 10 accounts in your niche and comment on them. And so people are going in and commenting great posts and wow, and like selling their, you know, their content in, in, in your post. So I think definitely that if you really enjoy someone's content, I think it's a great thing to do. And especially in arts, you know, it, it feels a bit more natural. I think when in the marketing niche, definitely it's become like a bit out of hand. If you're, con if they're spending your whole day I'd rather you create new content than spend all day like posting other people's pages. It's about yeah, it's about being authentic. If you put if you've got a, a real opinion and something that can actually add value to that post or that to that person's caption, then it's worthwhile. But if you're just saying, great, thank you. Well that like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or just like I get this all the time, people just like reiterating what I said in the content. It's like, yeah, thank you. <laughs>
Um, what other questions do we have? Um, what is the best time to post on Instagram? Um, it depends on your when your followers are online. I people really stress out about this, and I am of the opinion that you need to post when your followers are awake. So go into your um, Instagram insights and see like where the majority of your followers are and post between the times of like nine and nine, right? When they're awake. I don't really think it makes a huge difference the time that you post. You might post at lunchtime. I don't log on until five and then I see it at five and then you perhaps stress yourself out trying to post it at the same time every day. So you don't need to post at the same time every day. There is no optimum time. Um, yeah, I think that's not, I wouldn't say that's really like a very important uh, consideration. Does the aesthetic of your profile matter? No, not at all. <laughs> I think that people spend so much time trying to get like it's pink, then it's beige, it's pink, then it's beige, then it's green. And I think um, that the, the number of people that actually look at your overall feed is so low. Most people on Instagram have said this themselves. Most people discover your content post by post. So focus on making those individual posts really amazing and beautiful. Um, and then don't worry about how the overall feed looks because it's really only you that's looking at it. And I think we'll do one more. Let's see. Are there any stigmas over using text within pictures? I heard the, al I heard the algorithm or the general audience prefer faces. Yeah, so that is something that happens on Facebook. So if you're posting um, a post on Facebook, it its algorithm will, it always prefers faces. So you want to, and like close-ups of faces, this kind of um, frame, um, instead of you having, you know, loads of text on, on your, um, on your like hero image or your image that you use on Facebook. On Instagram, that's not as much of a consideration. The algorithm does know, it knows it is a text post versus um, a picture of someone's face, but there's no, you will not be penalized for using loads of text or only posting infographics or anything like that. But I think that definitely was the case, but no longer um, the case anymore. Okay. I think that is it. Um, I'm going to do my last few bits and pieces before we go. So, hope everybody enjoyed and you've got something from this presentation. Um, we will be sending out within the week or so. Um, some of the questions that we've seen, we will also I'll try and answer those for you as well and get them in. Um, either send them out or we'll, we'll make a, uh, another piece on the website about them. I see a lot of bits about alt text in there, so we'll try and answer those in a, another occasion. Um, but if you'd like to get in touch with Digital Culture Network or have a one-to-one -one with myself, um, you can get in touch here, okay? And also go to ace underscore DCN and give us a tweet. Let us know how good it was. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.